Well, yeah. So um, the you know the beginning, I was talking about you know you have you have the dispatches and you talk about the the braided narrative and the you know sometimes the paragraphs are one sentence. You have some lines, some great lines. What in this life is permanent if everything is foreign? You know, the, you talk about evolving ideas of erasure and assimilation. Um, you know, obviously the ideas of Puerto Rico and like it's uh, part of our country, but not. And, you know, have people seeing it as foreign. Um, and then, of course, there's some great stuff about tennis and the back and forth. I'm also a big fan of tennis. Um, and you talk about, I guess it would have been your grandma. And, and I remember the wording is earnest. That she was very earnest in saying, like, the only reason to learn Spanish, was, you know, the only reason, kind of like, help me here, but the reason that she was able, that Spanish was helpful would be to, like, she identified somebody on, like, the subway. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, the, the anecdote is that uh, she heard two guys planning some sort of crime on a subway and then mm -hmm. rat them out. So, to the <laughs> cops. And uh, so that was why I should learn Spanish. So you could be on the lookout for criminals, I guess. I mean, I, I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, obviously so much of the book is about, is about this loss, uh, this assimilation, this erasure, which like you said, wasn't your fault. wasn't a conscious choice. Um, and, you know, you talk about the, the racial slurs being thrown around. You talked about that earlier with, the idea of like the the family and keeping the stories going and having pride in, in in wherever you know we are from, I wonder about just ideas of like of that erasure and how it does seem to be in involuntary in many ways. It wasn't a choice you had. It wasn't a choice maybe that your dad had, and kind of how that worked as as an erasure um, through assimilation. Yeah, I mean, you know, my father was born in Brooklyn in 1940. And, uh, you know, what he said was that he grew up uh, and his parents spoke Spanish in the home, but he, uh, he would answer in English. And, you know, I don't know, you know, for instance, I mean, I don't know what they ate for dinner or lunch or breakfast growing up i don't know what uh what music they may have listened to in the house i know my father was a a big fan of doo-wop he was a doo-wop singer mm. so by the time he was a teenager in like 1956 57 58 moving forward there he was really into doo-wop uh acapella music mm. but i don't know if, if my grandfather ever played him any sort of traditional Puerto Rican music or, or any sort of Latin music at all. Um, so there was, I think pretty early on a, a denial of the culture of forgetting uh, kind of an organizational forgetting of hmm. where my grandfather came from and perhaps where my grandmother's own parents came from being Cuba and Spain. Hmm. Uh, so I, I don't think those cultures were fostered. My father didn't uh, ever speak of any of his family members. Um, he didn't uh, address, he, he, we never, eating Spanish foods of any kind, any kind of Latin foods, hmm. wasn't really a thing in, in my family at all. Uh, so, you know, all of the uh, the culture seem to have disappeared within one generation hmm. uh, is me and my sister being the second generation. There was really nothing for us to, to go on with it. Hmm. Um, yeah. And uh, again, none of this occurred to me uh, as, as a, as a thing to investigate as a thing to really think about and meditate on and perhaps write about until a few years ago, hmm. it was just the reality I grew up with and uh, I was aware of it. Um, but it never, it never presented itself as subject matter to me until just like five years ago. Wow, your grandfather. I mean, was he called Sixto? Like Americanized? Was it Sixto? Yeah, yeah. When you know, when people, when my heart, the only other person I heard call them, uh, the only two sounds of that word I can remember is my grandmother calling him Sixto, mm -hmm. uh, but then the priest who delivered uh, a mass, a funeral mass in 1987 when he died. I remember him calling him Sixto. Obviously, he didn't mm. have a uh, relationship with him. Mm. And he was probably, you know, uh, an Irish Catholic from, you know, New York mm. City. 
Uh, he called him Sixto, but my grandmother called him Sixto. And uh, so that was the only two times or the only two people I ever heard pronounce his name. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, there, you know, there's a parallel storyline where you, you write about him as a aspiring guitarist and, you know, um, in coming into New York, coming to New York via, I mean, I say via, it's not like he was there for a night, yeah, via Florida, you know, Calle Ocho, et cetera. Did, I mean, was this 100% made up about him? 85, like, you know what I mean? Like pretty 100% much. 100% made up. Yeah, I mean, yeah. as far as his journey to New York is 100% made up. He did have a guitar in his apartment mm -hmm. and he had the keyboard. And I remember him playing the keyboard. I don't remember him playing the guitar, mm -hmm. but he did have it. And I know he played. Um, maybe it's just something I don't remember. So I just, you know, used that as a springboard to think, okay, maybe he wanted to be a musician. Um, mm. So, but he didn't work as a professional musician uh, that I know of. Right. Um, though, yeah, and as far as how he got to uh, Brooklyn from uh, Puerto Rico, I have absolutely no idea. All of that mm. was invented. All of that was uh, mm. fabricated. You you write about him, um, you know, at the keyboard doing the "Speak Softly, Love." That was, I guess, in the wake of the Godfather. My that was my one of my parents' wedding songs, nineteen seventy three. So there you go. Oh, there but, you go. Yeah, maybe I mean, he was a keyboard. Beautiful, beautiful song, right? And uh, yeah, and obviously the Godfather was something that was very important to to me growing up, to my father growing up, and and I think it's something that he shared with his father too, because I mm. I remember them talking about the Godfather. Uh, hmm. and and you know certain teams of the film and certain references and such. So, yeah, that was a real thing. Well, there's there's talk in the book of you you wanted to go to Puerto Rico for for research and you know all the above and the right. pandemic hit. I mean, is there is there is there information still to be gleaned? I mean, is there is there a trip in the in the offing? Is there a you know ancestry.com? Are you going to be on with uh, Henry Louis Gates? You know, you know, it's very funny because <laughs> in the conversation the other night. People ask that question and they're doing a Q&A. And, and I, I am curious about Ancestry.com or 23andMe or whatever that's right, called. Right, right. And then I referenced Henry Lewis Gates and <laughs> um, said, I think it would be cool if he got into it. Um, and yeah, I was planning to go to Puerto Rico and then the pandemic happened. And then I was hoping to get a grant or a fellowship and, and none of that happened uh, to support that. And mm. That's a whole other story that I don't want to get into, <laughs> but um, so yeah, I uh, I don't know. I uh, I would like to go, but I also feel like I would want it to be tied into like maybe a a second edition of the book where I write mm -hmm. like a, a different chapter or a bunch yeah, of chapters yeah, yeah. about that experience. Um, I think that might be a cool thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I have thought about those issues and it bangs around in my head as a as a potential project in the future if certain things come together. Sure. Mr. Gates, if you're listening, get him on the show. Yeah. Get him on the show. Man. Yep. Well, the the book sent me down so many uh Wikipedia rabbit holes with the the tennis player Vitas Gerolitis and yep. and your your Italian um the hometown where you're from, where your family's from in Italy. Sounds like a beautiful place. Go there too. It huh? does sound like a beautiful place. And that's another place that I would like to go to. And, you know, maybe, uh, maybe somebody will send me there and, uh, there you go. I can write about that. There you go. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot about, about, about tennis that comes up in the book and you make these incredible connections and they're not, they're not overt, you know, connections between like, even with your mom having some health issues and lack of memory and just the tennis and, you know, so sorry uh, um, about the loss of your friend. Uh, Polly, you know, in Wisconsin. Yeah, right, yeah. You write about, you know, like I mean, banal is not even the word, but the banality of it. I mean, it was a huge loss for you, obviously, to to lose your father in eighty in eighty seven or so. No, uh, but my grandfather 90, was eighty seven, and my Pardon father me. was ninety seven. Yeah, right. I mean, obviously, such a huge loss and the loss of your friend. You know, you hadn't known him in so long, but a horrible way, and just those of us can identify, right? We've lost loved ones. Just man, the the freaking sun comes up again. What? What? Why is it? Why is the sun out today? Why? Why do I, mean, I have to, yeah. why do I have to eat today? You know? Yeah. So I wonder, like, I guess my overall question, just about how you even link tennis and, and fairly commonplace, you know, things you do on a, on a regular basis with some huge topics like 
your mother's health and your father passing away and, you know, the loss of, of your friend and even just like aging, you know, with yourself, like yeah. tennis, where does tennis um, play in there as a metaphor? I mean, a lot of, I mean, David Foster Wallace did it. It's been done, but you have such an interesting spin and in, in, on, on, the, on the communities that you found in tennis as well. Well, yeah, I mean, I think initially I, I, I picked out tennis because it's something I'm passionate about, something I love, something that I, uh, I engage with quite a lot. And I wanted to write about tennis uh, because I was writing about all these family um, matters and, and, you know, the history, the assimilation, the lack of family history and culture and connection to it. Uh, whereas with tennis, it's something I do know, so, mm. uh, something I do have a connection to, and, and I have connection to people there. So it seemed to me like a good juxtaposition mm. once I st I just started it because I wanted to write about tennis. Mm. And then over the course of time, it occurred to me that it served as a good relief and a good counterpoint to the family stuff to bring in the tennis stuff because it, it, de it demonstrated connection. It demonstrated uh, other examples of people who are from all different walks of life and ethnicities mm. and races and, and their own stories. I, I, I used one or two of them in the book of, mm -hmm. of a similar kind of uh, assimilation and erasure so I, I, you know, initially it was just kind of a, uh, I wanted to talk about tennis and that was the be all and end all. But then mm. kind of subsequent to that, I found its relevancy and how it connects to mm. the book. And so even the same thing with, with my, my friend, Polly, who was murdered by a policeman in, um, in Wisconsin, I, I just felt like, okay, I, I've got to talk about Polly somehow because it's important to me. And I wrote a piece uh, and all of that was true. Like playing tennis the first time after Paulie died, it felt weird to me mm -hmm. to be out there playing tennis. And so, but it, it didn't connect to the, the Puerto Rico stuff, if you will, until I really thought about it. I said, okay, how can I make this germane to the book? And, and then the idea, because when people talk about, cops killing people in this country, they often make the wrongheaded uh, assumption, and I've heard this from many people, oh, that cops kill black people, um, but cops actually kill more white people than they do black people. Obviously, the percentage is, right, percentage. is screwed up. The, the large proportion, you know, too many black people get arrested and incarcerated, and it's a massive problem, and it's a disaster, and it's, and it's a shameful element of, of this disaster of a country. Um, but the truth is the cops kill everybody mm. and th they really don't care too much who you are. Uh, they will brutalize and kill you. And so thinking about my place and how I'm viewed, because so much of the book mm. grapples with the idea that, oh, well, people look at me a certain way, given my, um, my name and my complexion and, and uh, you know, everything else, I suppose. Uh, my, my friend, Sam, who, you know, is a small character, if you will, in the book, he's, when we were driving through Georgia, mm. he said, you know, you're going to get us killed. Like some cop is going to pull over. They're going to see you and we're going to get shot. And, uh, you know, it's gallows humor to deal with mm. you know, the, the horrors of the country. Uh, but so it made me think, oh, what would cops you know, I've been stopped a couple of times by cops in, in cars for speeding or whatever, but, you know, nothing ever happened. Mm. Um, but, you know, obviously that, that obviously is something that millions of people get pulled over by police and, and, and everything goes smoothly. Of course, the, the news stories of cops killing people happen all too frequently mm. for all different reasons. Um, but Again, I found ways to make it germane to the book. And uh, we found instances of, of Puerto Ricans being killed by cops in the mm. 50s and news articles on that. So it was a way to talk about all these issues. So mm -hmm. um, discovering those connections was one of the, the greatest. Uh, the greatest pleasures and I, I hesitate to use the word pleasure of course because mm -hmm. there's so many dark topics here but in making mm -hmm. this an actual book a coherent book that is of a piece 
that even though some of the things seem disparate, mm-hmm. they're they're not. They are all connected. Well, yeah, and there's, I mean, it's it's a great pleasure for the reader. Again, pleasure, maybe not the right term, but pleasure for right. the reader to, to find all these links. Back to your tennis, 111 miles per hour on your serve. Yeah, I could pump it up there. Okay. Dang. I mean, uh, I don't know exactly, but I feel like when you watch the pros, they're not that much higher. Well, I mean, the real like so the, <laughs> the pros, the real great pros can get it up into like the 130s. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah, the one thirty. Somebody might hit one forty every so often. Yeah. Um. So like one hundred five or one ten is a, is a far cry from that. Sure. But uh, it's it's a pretty it's a you know it comes in hot a little bit sometimes. And I'm not trying to I, return I, that. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I get to play with some people who are pretty good, and and I face some guys who serve probably a buck twenty or mm. a buck twenty five and. Yeah, there is tough to get a racket on sometimes. <laughs> I'm uh I mean it's a great t- tennis has been a great covid sport, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it really is. And Man. uh it was uh something that was after being inactive during covid for so long during lockdown hmm. when we were finally able to get back on the court again, it it was a real blessing. I feel like I want to find out find my community. I mean, I've played tennis on and off. I played my senior high school. I'd you know, play with my brother. It's a great bonding thing. Um, I love, feel like I read this book. I want to get back into it, you know. I think you uh, should, right? And you talk about, you know, some of your friends. Uh, sorry, remind me of his name. He comes from a Chinese family, but speaks Spanish very well. You know, his family. Uh, was yeah, Dominican, his name you know. is Carrie Eng. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. He uh, grew up in, in in an agrarian city in, in China, and like many members of his family, when when that industry has struggled. Uh, made their way elsewhere in the world. And so many of them went to Latin America, all over Latin America. Mm-hmm. He's got relatives in Mexico and, and in, in the Dominican. And he grew up uh, largely in Puerto Rico. He went to boarding school there mm-hmm. that spoke English primarily, but he did learn Spanish. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I, I found that to be both uh, comical and uh, entertaining and beautiful. That right. here's this... Chinese man speaking Spanish, and I am a, a Puerto Rican guy who doesn't. Hmm. So you know, throughout the book, there, I mean, there are dis- destructive word. You use the word destructive annihilation, in you know, with relation to assimilation. We talked about how it wasn't necessarily, or that you know of, it wasn't necessarily a lot of conscious choices, maybe, or maybe just one, right? But there's also a lot that I found so interesting about, like you being second second generation, you'd say, or you know, the next generation. And, you know, I, I feel this having creature comforts, right? Yeah. You, you write for a living. Not that that's easy, <laughs> you know, but you didn't have, you don't have to do the, you know, maybe the physical labor of previous generations. You, you go to Salt Lake City for conferences and, you know, they, they, they leave you things and they make it nice for you, even though they got the ants, right? Um, right. But just like, is, is guilt the right word? I mean, is there a sense of like, is that kind of what you were exploring there? Like, almost like guilt, like, man, I got it easy or easier compared to previous generations. Cause I feel that. Yeah, you know, it's not, it's not, I don't feel a guilt. You know, maybe that speaks to some sort of sociopathic uh, tendency. In no, me, no, but, no, no, no. Yeah. I know it's not a guilt that I feel at all, but, but it is a realization that, that, you know, my grandfather was a blue collar working man and who mm-hmm. used his muscles. And my father was the same. And, uh, you know, I did, you know, I worked as a waiter for many years um, of my life. Mm. Uh, so, you know, I was, you know, that's not quite the same as what they did, but it, it's an, a, a taxing physical job. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did that for a long, long time, you know, up until probably my early 30s uh, before I could actually teach and make a living from teaching. But, uh, yeah, so it's not guilt, but it is a recognition yeah. of yeah. the things that they did to make their children's lives better. And uh, and it's an appreciation of that and respecting that as a uh, as their accomplishment. Hmm. And I ruptured my Achilles tendon uh, playing hoops. Oh, it, was a, it was a game winning shot, but you know who's counting? Um, <laughs> no one was in five feet of me. I don't jump that high, but you know, ruptured the Achilles. And I just think of like, man, like my grandpa, my great grandpa. They they would have never walked again, right? Or they would have, you know, they would have walked with a huge limp. Their whole the rest life, of their life right? after that yeah yeah right? without yeah those kind you of know, things about future generations yeah 
Right. Yeah. You know, we, we have it easier in a great many number of ways. And, and, uh, but it's not our fault, right? But it's, it's not our I mean, it's recognition. Like you uh, said, yeah. It's just happenstance of when we were born. The book is, um, you know, because it's in, in so many places so understated, like we talked about, but it's just there's so much power in that understatement. And the ending of the book is is almost like a I always get confused if downhill or uphill is a good thing when people say like, oh, it's all downhill from here. But it's right. kind of, you know, it's 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 very unemotional, but it's so powerful without giving away the ending. Right. It right. just it kind of unfurls. Right. And so, yeah. it, you know, just overall, just a. A huge congratulations again on on a book that is uh it's raw it, it speaks to a lot of what people will will appreciate whether it's cultural assimilation whether it's um you know you had some i wanted to finish maybe with one image that was so powerful for me was talking about your grandpa and how he would eat so slowly right and you you connect that to like man like i ate so fast i i understand that me personally uh -huh. I, did, I i wish i would have you know, I wish I could have, I wish I would have maybe taken some time. And, and where was it you're from? What, tell me about Maya Guez, right? The city and, and how you got here. And I think that rings true. I know that rings true for me and rings true for so many people. So it, it's, the book is so powerful because of the honesty, because of the understatement. And so I just want to, you know, congratulate you again. I want to tell people listening, like buy this dang book. You, uh, you, you shouted out, um, you know, a couple of bookstores, but any particular places you're like, hey, buy this here, whether online or in person? Well, of course, I, I always advocate like all the writers do, like your favorite independent bookstore, your local independent bookstore. And uh, if you want to do it online, bookshop.org okay. uh, is a great uh, venue that's not Amazon. But of course, you know, I use Amazon still and it's yeah, yeah, yeah. a wonderful service. And if that's your way to get the book, then I say any way you can get it. I appreciate it very much. I'm very grateful. There you, there you go. I know you're kind of like taking a deep breath and, you know, you're, you're done with it and you're out in the world. Any future projects? You're kind of like, I'm going to wait a little bit on that. I'm like, yeah, it's, I'm in a little holding pattern and a wait and see of what's going to be next for me. There you go. Again, so awesome to talk to you. Um, you know, in, in the show notes for this, I'll, I actually do have a bookshop.org link to buy the book and some of the great reviews. and. Um, Thanks so much for taking the time and, and I wish you great luck in the future. Thank you very much, Pete. I really appreciate all the smart questions and the conversation. It was really great.